Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you, you will see that my, my lecture will uh, fits very well with what you uh, heard just a minute ago. Then I'm going to speak about monitoring and also management of cardiogenic shock. I put here the main messages of my uh, lecture. I will indeed ask you to run to the cath lab if you have a cardiogenic shock related to acute coronary syndrome. And again, this makes sense. I will also show you the guidelines of both the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and the European Society of Cardiology and Heart Failure Association. When a patient is hemodynamically unstable and cardiogenic shock, we should first perform a rapid transthoracic echo. And if after the cath lab the patient is still in cardiogenic shock, I will show you how we should uh, use echocardiography, biomarkers, measurement of cardiac output to stroke volume, and indeed I will uh, de give details on what the recommendation and guidelines are talking about a pulmonary artery catheter if needed. We heard about cardiogenic shock. You heard even about the CART shock trial that is done under the umbrella of the uh, GREAT network that is now a worldwide network on acute heart failure and cardiogenic shock. This cohort uh, led by Velipeka Ariola uh, included uh, nine uh, countries throughout uh, Europe. And as you can see here, we are really talking about cardiogenic shock, one of the largest cohort, cohort at least one of the largest biobank, and you will see the results of uh, biomarkers measured during cardiogenic shock. You see that cardiogenic shock, we are not only talking about decrease in systolic and diastolic blood pressure, we are also talking about clinical findings and maybe to come back to one of the questions that was raised by the room, maybe future research to, should see how we can switch from only clinical signs, which is today the definition of cardiogenic shock, to maybe more sophisticated way of assessing the severity of cardiogenic shock, and you see here the signs of cardiogenic shock. And through the umbrella of the GREAT network, we published an intensive care uh, medicine last year uh, using all the top experts all around the globe on acute heart failure and cardiogenic shock. And we said that the way to manage those patients and monitor those patients is first to go very quickly. And we said that within 15 minutes of admission, we need to check whether the patient is hemodynamically stable, then we are talking more about acute heart failure, or hemodynamically unstable, then here we are talking about cardiogenic shock and low cardiac uh, output heart failure. And we said that in the next hour, we should quickly, talking about cardiogenic shock, check whether there is an acute coronary syndrome and in cardiac shock, as we just heard, we can say that in, at least in Europe, 75 to 80 percent of cardiogenic shock in Europe today are related to acute coronary syndrome. Then those patients in the large majority, uh, we should run to the cath lab whether you put an intraartic balloon pump or not, this will be discussed tomorrow, and then the patient will go to the ICU, uh, CCU. Then the question that uh, I was asked to raise is, how are we going to monitor those patients? And I'm referring to the consensus that was published a few years ago by the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, including some members from the European Society of Cardiology, and you see here some names of a known intensivist uh, in Europe and the US known on the hemodynamic area. The recommendations are rather clear. First, if you have a patient who is hemodynamically unstable, you start therapy that could be uh, a little bit of fluid loading or if you think an inotrope, if you start that therapy and the patient is stable, then you can stop there. But if you start the initial therapy 
and the patient still, uh, is still hemodynamically unstable, the first exam to do is echocardiography, and it's clearly said echocardiography is the preferred monitoring to initially evaluate the type of shock. And I'm going to explain in the next slides why echocardiography is so important. A few years ago, together with Antoine Verbaron and Bernard Cholet, we put together a big program in the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine that was, by the way, taken by the US, Asia Pacific, and uh, now it's a worldwide program, is what is needed for every intensivist, er every cardiologist working in intensive care, every emergency room physician. And we drew this pyramid, and we said that every young physician taking care of emergencies needs to know how to detect large pericardial effusion, recognize a marked right ventricular dilatation, measure IVC diameter, and recognize a severely abnormal left ventricular contractility. And we could show, and there are several papers in the meanwhile, showing that few hours or few days are enough to see those young people performing those four parameters. And indeed, the more you are expert, the more uh, you handle uh, a global situation. And here there is now a European diploma where all the intensivists can handle all uh, those cases. Now, why did we say that the right ventricle needs to be understood? Because in some cases, when patients is coming with cardiogenic shock and he's hypotensive, tachycardic, Sometimes you cannot understand why he's hypotensive and cardiogenic shock if you don't have an echo. And the echo has the big advantage that within a few minutes, without be, being a big expert, within a few minutes you can make the diagnosis that will lead to therapy. I'm going to show you three cases focused on the right ventricle because it's really the area that is now uh, growing because we are discovering that we are uh, overlooking the right ventricle in acute condition. This is a patient here with hypotension, tachycardia, and you can see immediately with a transthoracic echo, we can see that he has a, a pericardial effusion, uh, and this pericardial effusion is uh, occluding the right ventricle. The right ventricle cannot expand, and you see here that the patient who received volume loading, the the volume loading will stay upstream the right ventricle and the right atria, and upstream the right ventricle and the right atria, we have the IVC diameter that should be 12 millimeter, around 10 to 12, and here it's 25. And clearly, we have a right ventricular dysfunction. Here it's another case of a patient coming from uh, a cath lab. He had a stroke. He went to uh, uh, the cath lab to... Uh, try to remove the uh, thrombus, and uh, after that he came to the ICU for a cardiogenic shock, and here again the echo within minutes could show that the right ventricle, the size of the right ventricle, is as large as the left ventricle, and this is totally abnormal because the right ventricle should be below 0.7, 0.7 of the size of the left ventricle, and together with this enlargement in the right ventricle, you clearly see here a huge tricuspid regurgitation explaining a, a, a large decrease in the uh, cardiac output and the cardiogenic shock. This patient had ultrafiltration and he did uh, recover very well. And I would like to show you here a case that we had a few days ago and I, when I had this case I thought immediately I'm going to show it to you guys. This is a patient also who came in uh, cardiogenic shock we did the echo, and uh, it looks like a flower. Uh, here is the echo of the IVC. The IVC is here. And what is really spectacular here is that the hepatic veins that usually you hardly see, or there are at least less than one or two millimeter, and you see here that the hepatic vein have a huge size together with this huge size of the IVC. And here, without any question, you can say that the pressure inside the inferior vena cava is very, very high. 
We put a, a catheter, by the way, in this patient, and the central venous pressure was 23 millimeter of mercury. Then you see that when the pressure is so high, the blood cannot flow from the liver to the right atria, and there is a huge congestion. Here you have the right atria, and you see here the diagnosis is that the patient has a pericardial constraint related to uh, tuberculosis. Now, what is interesting is that this patient has this right ventricular dysfunction related to pericardial constraint. If we go to the short axis, we see that not only the right ventricle is dilated, but you see that the septum here uh, is not enlarging during the diastole, during left ventricular diastole. Then you see here that we have a left ventricular diastolic dysfunction only related to the huge pressure in the right ventricle, and you see clearly that the septum is dyskinetic. And this diastolic dysfunction of this left ventricle led, as you can see here, to a huge left atria. And it's interesting to see that this patient has initially a right ventricular dysfunction that led to a left ventricular diastolic dysfunction, and in fact his cardiogenic shock was related because he came for a diarrhea in the emergency room and they gave him a lot of fluids. And you see here, when you give a lot of fluids, indeed the fluids will stay upstream the right ventricle. And then the higher is the right ventricular size, the more the left ventricle is dilated, the more it's going to occlude the left ventricle and then we will end up with cardiogenic shock. And again, without echo, it's impossible to diagnose the mechanism of cardiogenic shock in those patients. Then I hope I convince you that echocardiography should be really the first tool to use, at least this is what is written in the recommendation, to try to see whether the patient has a predominant right ventricular dysfunction, left ventricular dysfunction, or global heart failure. If the patient has a right ventricular dysfunction, is there a tamponade? If yes, then clearly he needs to go uh, to have a pericardial synthesis or surgery. If there is no tamponade, then we will come in, in a minute to say that this is an indication, right ventricular dysfunction without tamponade. This may be an indication of a PA catheter. And again, we will see in a minute how we are going to use the catheter, uh, looking on the level of the pulmonary arterial pressure to uh, separate between pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular ischemia. Now, if you do the echo, and it's mostly the left ventricular failure, you should first check whether there is a massive mitral regurgitation. If not, clearly there is a light, right uh, left ventricular dysfunction and then you need to measure cardiac output and you need to measure uh, stroke uh, volume. Then again, if we come back to the guidelines and recommendation of European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, echo within minutes, I hope I convince you that will help you a lot to make diagnosis, mostly of right ventricular dysfunction. In the guidelines, it's also recommended to measure cardiac output and stroke volume. I think you heard during the first lecture, there is no discussion. Cardiogenic shock is consistently associated with a low stroke volume or low cardiac output. You need to measure to confirm cardiogenic shock, but you need also to measure stroke volume to see the effect of your therapy, whether your therapy is going to improve stroke volume or sometimes if you are giving a detrimental effect, it, uh, stroke volume can stay stable or even worsening. And this reason why you use whatever technique you want, whether it's continuous or discontinuous, but you need to measure cardiac output and stroke volume. The question that is often raised uh, in the last months and last years, and I often hear it in the meetings, is, is there still a, a place for pulmonary artery catheter in cardiogenic shock? The answer is yes, at least in 2014, when we published the recommendation in the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, we said there is two indications. Refractory shock means you have a patient coming with shock. You do the initial measures, patient is still unstable. And the second indication is right ventricular dysfunction. Are we still using PAC catheter all around the world? This is a paper that just came out a few weeks ago in JAMA Cardiology showing the use of pulmonary artery catheter in the United States throughout uh, the last uh, 20 years or so. Uh, 
and this has been done with a big database of Medicare and Medicaid. You can see that the, there is a decrease in the use of pulmonary acid catheter from 1999 to roughly 2010, 2009, 2010, and there is a decrease of uh, roughly minus 70 percent. However, it's interesting to see that in the last three or four years, the use of PSC catheter is uh, stable and even increasing a little bit. And interestingly enough, when they looked in the last three or four years, in the patients who got a PSC catheter compared to the patient in, uh, with the use of inotropes who did not have a PAC catheter, they could show that the patients with a PAC catheter had a decrease in in-hospital and 30 days mortality, but also a decrease in length of stay. Then clearly what we are learning is that probably now we are using the PAC catheter on the best indication, and now maybe it's time to redo a study with a PAC catheter because many years ago we are using catheter maybe in a wrong indication. Now uh, those who are using are more expert and using it in the right uh, way. Why is those PAC catheter decreasing in the U.S. in the last years? Because now they are mostly used in heart failure and you see that the top indication 20 years ago were respiratory failure. There is much less ARDS than before, first in the intensive cares, but also you see that uh, maybe because of a reduction of iatrogenic uh, reasons of respiratory failure, you see that now heart failure is the top indications, and again, this was associated, at least in the paper, with an improvement in mortality and, and the length of stay. Are there other evidence that using a PSC catheter in cardiogenic shock is associated with a better outcome? The answer is yes. This paper uh, also came out in 2014. This is the ATTEND registry. It's a very large registry from uh, Japan, more than 4,000 patients. What they did, they did a propensity score matching 1,004 patients, then 502, 502 patients, control patients and patients with a, a pulmonary artery catheter, all those patients were in cardiogenic shock or acute heart failure with the use of inotropes, and all those patients had an inotrope. You can see here a cumulative all cause of death or cardiac death. You see here it's over 30 days, and you see that consistently there was a reduction in both all cause mortality and cardiac death in the patients in Japan, in the patients who uh, received inotrope than mostly patients in cardiogenic cell. Then again, I think what we just saw in the uh, American paper recently published and what was published in Japan is if you uh, have the catheter used by the expert, if they are really monitoring uh, their treatment uh, through the PAC catheter, you can see a clear green light and green signs of reduction in all cause or cardiovascular mortality. Biomarkers are novel in acute heart failure. They are even novel in cardiogenic shock. This is a paper uh, uh, through the Card Shock Trial and uh, the Great Network published uh, recently uh, in uh, Critical Care Medicine. Cardiogenic shock related to acute coronary syndrome. You see here that in survivors the anti-pro BNP uh, stayed low. And you see that in patients that who are going to die in the next 90 days, you see that immediately within 12 hours already of admission, then few hours after admission, you already see the anti-proBNP uh, increasing. And in the publication, this is the main figure of the publication, we could show that the combination of anti-proBNP and ST2 could indicate within hours of admission, then you have a patient coming with cardiogenic shock, please, within a few hours, measure at least anti-proBNP, and if you can, the combination anti-proBNP and ST2. If the two are elevated, you can say within a few hours that there is more than 80% chance that this patient will die. And this is very good because you can use it to uh, uh, push for an indication of a left ventricular assist device, or at least a device that you can put immediately without waiting the patient being worse and worse. On the other hand, if the two biomarkers are low, you see that the chance of dying is very, very low. If they are really below those thresholds, the mortality is very, very low. Then you see that here for the first time, 
we have clear indications of using biomarkers in the monitoring and management of cardiogenic shock. What means the increase in biomarkers? You see that in those patients with the two biomarkers, nt BNP and ST2 elevated, and when the two are elevated, these are associated with the lowest ejection fraction, the lowest cardiac index, the lowest EGFR, and the highest uh, um, liver uh, enzymes. And really, it's not only fancy biomarkers, the combination of the two biomarkers when they are elevated, it means that underneath the organs are uh, suffering. Just to finish with this uh, paper that comes from the European Society of Cardiology and the Heart Failure Association together with the Working Group of Pulmonary Circulation, for the first time we, give, we gave clear indications on the management and monitoring of acute right ventricular dysfunction. Indeed, we said here that you should assess the severity of acute right vent ventricular failure, try to find quickly what is the etiology. But here, we clearly said that if the patient is still hemodynamically unstable, we need to put him in the ICU, we need to, put, we need to do echo, we need to uh, put a swan guns if the patient is still hemodynamically unstable. And as you heard in the first presentation, we said that we need to be very careful with volume loading when there is a right ventricular dysfunction. A little bit of volume loading, no excess. This is harmful for the patient. And we said that we should use a norepinephrine in emergency to m restore blood pressure and to restore organ uh, perfusion. Then, ladies and gentlemen, the main message of my lectures were if you have a cardiogenic shock, if it's clearly related to acute coronary syndrome, please run to the cath lab. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, we should first perform a rapid echocardiography, even in the cath lab, by the way. If after the cath lab the patient is still in cardiogenic shock, echo can help you a lot, maybe to diagnose a right ventricular dysfunction that was overlooked. Biomarkers can help a lot to uh, directors toward the prognosis. If the patient is in cardiogenic shock with already signs of bad prognosis, we better have to put an assist device instead of increasing the catecholamine levels, measure cardiac output and stroke volume, and I hope I convince you that there is still rooms and there is new hopes with the use of pulmonary artery catheter. Thank you very much.